I'll go over the paints that we're going to use. Um, but again, use what you have, follow along when you can. And, you know, as we go, if you have questions or something isn't working out for you, just give me a shout. Um, that said, also, folks that just want to watch along and take some notes, that's, that's a perfectly acceptable thing as well. All right, so I've got um, 10 o'clock um, Central. It's 11 o'clock my time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, for folks that have taken my classes before, um, this is going to be repetitive. I'll kind of say this kind of opening spiel at the beginning of all my classes. Uh, so first, what you should know is I like to teach in a method that uses uh, kind of easy to source materials. Now for weathering, there are some materials out there uh, like this stuff here. Um, I'm not going to be teaching using that, um, but there are some other things that you can get that will help your weathering. But I like to to use materials that just anybody can find, uh, just any you know local store. Maybe you already have. I also like to use things that are cost effective. These products here they work great, but they're they're not cheap. Um, so that's kind of a, a theme that will go along. And I also like to teach in a method that uh, gives you a really cool effect for less effort. All right, so in this class, what we're going to do is I'll show you several different ways to do very similar effects. That doesn't mean that you have to use all of those ways on everything you do. You pick the one or two things that you like to do the best, and the rest you just kind of put back for another time. Um, it's not meant to give you uh, the, the definitive answer on this is how you do weather in absolute, um, because there are a million different ways to do a lot of the, the things that we'll do in this class. It's not saying any of the things that we don't cover are wrong. It's just saying this is another way to do it. So you know, take it as a tool through the toolbox. And there are two other weathering classes, both taught by very competent um, instructors. They teach a different method. Um, and I would, I would highly recommend taking those as well, uh, just to see what works best for you. Because as we all know, we all paint differently. We're all at different parts of our journey. Uh, speaking of journey, um, a lot of the techniques that I'll teach are, are very uh, basic level. So beginners, people new to painting, um, that'd be great for you to learn. Uh, more advanced painters, people that's been doing this a while, that may seem a little boring to you. Um, but when we do those things, just kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt that there are folks, very mixed audience here. So our folks in the audience who may not be as far along in the journey as you are. Uh, the other end of that spectrum, some of the stuff we do might be a little advanced for you if you're a new painter. So if um, we hit a section like that, just kind of take some notes. And when you get to that part of your, your journey where you want to experiment with that kind of thing, then you know feel free to experiment and, and have at it. Um, but again, if it's if it's too challenging, don't feel like you have to do it. It's not a definitive answer to all things weather. All right, so the other thing I want to mention um, a lot of the colors of paints that I use, I want you to think more of in the spirit of that color. It doesn't have to be that exact color to get this effect to work. For example, when I use black and brown, don't think you have to have black and brown. You just need a really dark brown um, and you can mix that yourself, whatever. If I use um, Numeria Rust, just know that it's kind of a dark brownish orange color. So just try to think of colors that are similar to what I'm using, and the effect will come out about the same. Um, now, there is a list in the PDF of colors that I'm using. And again, it doesn't mean you have to go out and buy those exact colors to have things work exactly right for you. Um, some things you know, that I may use might be uh, discontinued. So I try to avoid that when I'm teaching. But again, just remember, Something similar to that color will, will do the same effect. Okay, so that being said, I have a surprise guest. My cat is just walking in the room, so let me throw her out and uh, shut the door. Sorry about that. My uh, my cat likes to get in my lap when I paint, so I wanted her out of the picture. All right, so now that we've went over the basics, what I'm going to show you. Um, first, is just to kind of think about steel at rest. Um, and there's two ways to do this. You may have miniatures that are already painted, um, like this one here, 
that you want to add some weathering to. So what we're going to do down here on his, his lower leg here is a nice little flat area. We're going to start making that look rusty. So one way to do that is if you take a dark brown, I'm going to use black and brown. You're going to add this in layers to make it look rusty. But rather than just take a brush and kind of paint it on, what we're going to do is uh, it's called stippling. So you take an old beat up brush like this one. Uh, this is one that I used in last night's uh, realistic horror class. And it's got a little glue in the bristles. It's, it's kind of useless uh, for normal painting. But for this, it'll work good. So we're going to make a stippling brush. So take an old beat up brush and you just kind of cut the uh, the tips off to kind of flatten it out. So if you guys can see that, all I've done is just cut the bristles right off of it. And now these, I'll just kind of flare those out. This works really good with old brushes that have, you know, maybe paint down in a ferrule or whatever. So when you're painting and you're doing your hobby and a brush starts to get, lose its tip, starts to get worn out, don't throw that brush away. There are always uses for, for old brushes and this is one. So now that we have a good stippling brush, uh, Yeah, it's persistent. Um, now that we have a good stippling brush, what I'm going to do is just kind of load it up with that dark brown paint. And I'm going to get a lot of the paint off. Not quite like a dry brush. You can see there's there's still a fair amount of paint on there. And I'm just going to stipple about 75% of that area. We'll do the other side too. So just kind of darkening it up because rust. It will have multiple colors. If you look, you think about an old shed out the backyard, um, it's going to have multiple layers, different colors. So we start with that black and brown. Next, I'm going to go to a dark red. I'm using clotted red, but any kind of a maroon color will work because rust on steel, it doesn't really weather uniform. You'll get different shades, different variants of color in there. So again, taking most of that paint off the brush, you can see there's just a little bit on there. I'm gonna do about half of that area of brown. I'm gonna hit with this kind of maroon color. So just kind of hinting at there's some different colors in there. I realize this piece is a little small. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. It'll just show up a little bit more with this color. This is a Numeria rust. Uh, any dark orange will work. Um, in fact, I use goblin skin a lot for this as well. And again, just uh, load up your stippling brush, wipe a lot of it off just above a dry brush consistency. And again, just a part of that area that you've covered so that you can still see those other, other colors shining through. So now if you can see that, um, we've got multiple colors down there on his, his lower legs. And then lastly, I'm using explosion orange. You need a lighter orange. Um, hearth fire will work good. Um, explosion orange seems to be my favorite. And for this, we just want to use, let me shake that a little more. We just want to use it kind of sparingly. And if you think about like um, in an old train yard, you can see some of those box cars that's rusted. They get kind of this orangey look on them when they first start. So it's kind of right at the edges. I'm going to hit. Just kind of stipple on a little bit of this orange. And for me, that, that kind of sells that effect. So hopefully you guys can see that okay. All right, so that's kind of the basics of how steel will rust. So I'm going to do the same thing up here just to kind of go over it again. And I'll move a little faster this time. So taking the black and brown, just going to kind of stipple that in randomly. Cover it about 75% of the area that I want to do. And again, I, I do part of it because I want some of that, that paint to show through, you know, like this thing, you know, back in its day was probably pretty awesome looking, but now it's rusted, it's weathered. So by doing these multiple layers and, you know, allowing some of the blue and the purple to kind of show through. It kind of gives you that effect of 
you know, varied amounts of rust on different parts. So I went to the maroon. Now I'm going to go to the rust color. And just kind of a little bit less on each layer so that you can still see the other colors through it. And then lastly, the explosion orange. Just a very little bit here and there. Now, the other thing you'll see with steel is sometimes the parts, uh, especially where parts rub things, you'll see uh, it wears it down to just the very amount. So if you take a little uh, silver, like I'm going to use true silver. And I'll use a, a decent brush, it doesn't have to be great. Um, and then just here and there, just kind of put some hints of where it's worn all the way down to just the bare metal. Mostly uh, kind of at the edges. This will also help you develop a little bit of contrast in your piece. And you don't want to overdo it, just about here and there. Just to kind of show it's it's worn all the way down to bare metal. All right, so any questions on on just general steel? Now that was on a pre-painted figure, but what if you had a a figure that you knew you wanted to look weathered from the start? Well, the same technique kind of works, except that you can now go opposite. So we'll work here on the top. I'm going to start with the. Uh, the regular brush, doesn't even have to be the best brush, just uh, one that you can put the paint on. And I'm gonna put a very thin layer of this dark brown over everything. And you just wanna cover it all at this point. And what this will do is kind of give you a, a base of say, uh, you're working, you're, you're kind of working in the opposite fashion here um, because we're going to add the rust and then we're going to stipple on some, some color to simulate uh, paint flecks. This will also save you a little time if you're doing like a whole army of them um, because it's, it's a little bit easier to do these you know, kind of weathered effects than it is to say get a very smooth blend here and then and then go back and weather. Um, now, Elizabeth, uh, metal will rust in a general direction. We're going to get to that a little bit more. Um, so on this piece, I was just kind of doing it uh, kind of just general area. But if you have something where like water is dripping, um, and we'll get to that a little later, the rust will be kind of more concentrated in those areas. It also happened, if you think about an old pickup truck, it happened around the wheel wells first before it does, you know, a part of the body somewhere. So anywhere where the water will collect and stay is where the rust is going to be. Now, on this piece, I kind of imagine that it's moving around quite a bit. Um, even though it has been sitting out in the weather, it still moves around quite a bit, so the water doesn't really stand up. So going back to this piece, I gave it a, a base coat of this... Uh, um, black and brown. And uh, kind of the same thing. I'm going to take my stippling brush and just kind of stipple in some of those other colors. Again, start out with quite a bit of the area covered by the marine. If you notice, I'm not really cleaning off my brush, um, just kind of wiping it off. I think that kind of helps the effect in general. And I'm going to add some more of this Mary Rust. And then finally, the uh, explosion orange, just sporadically and kind of sparingly. And I will show through on the edges here. I'll imagine that some of these have worn down to this bare metal. And then I want to uh, show some colors from, you know, like paint that is still there. So on this one, it doesn't matter what color. I'm going to grab Templar Blue because it was within reach. Now, if you remember on this piece, we got just little areas of the colors that have not rusted out. So again, we'll take this stippling brush and we can kind of do the same thing. 
like this to kind of show where some paint has remained. So when you get done, the end effect is very similar. Um, but you can see that this one, you know, I spent a lot less time on it because on this piece, I spent, you know, quite a bit of time painting this all up, giving it some shadows and all that. And then I covered it with all the weathering. On this piece, I don't really have to worry about that because the weathering kind of takes, takes care of that for me. So from the reason I'm doing that is because a lot of times you'll have pieces that you've already finished that you want to weather. And this is to kind of give you the kind of the both sides of it. Uh, for me, if I know I want a piece to look weathery, I'm going to start out from the start painting it weathered. And just to uh, add to the effect, I'm going to think of uh, this paint may have oxidized a little bit. So I'm going to use a little bit lighter color of the blue. And just kind of put some random, like oxidized paint looks on it. So from there, you can see hopefully that uh, you have multiple layers in there. It looks like it's weathered at different rates. Um, and there's kind of flaking paint still here and there. So that's, that's your basic steel. Now, if I were going to do a sword, for example, um, I may already have this miniature painted somewhere. And again, if you're working along at home, um, if you have something within reach, you can do this. If not, just kind of follow along. Same technique, you know, I've got this nice silver on his sword. Um, you can kind of stipple the black and brown on. I need to get a little bit more of that paint. And there's a reason I'm doing the sword, I'll show you. Um, because it's kind of a flat surface. Same exact thing we just did. A little bit of the maroon on there, not quite as much as the black and brown, so you can see both. Um, we're going to get to copper in a minute, so give me a second. Um, right now we're just focusing on steel. Now I'm adding some of the new Mary and rust. And then lastly, uh, some brighter orange, uh, like explosion orange, just kind of sparingly. All right, but the thing about edge or, uh, swords is that they do have an edge. So what we wanna do is kind of reclaim that edge because even if this is a rusty store, sword, where he's been hacking on people, this edge is not gonna be rusted. You're gonna to wanna to kind of glaze over that with the silver to kind of recapture this edge and make it look sharp again. Now, also, where this may have hit other swords, it may have knocked off some of that rust. So you can add a few scratch marks on there. The point of this is think about what the metal has gone through. Um, so even though it's weathered and rusted, where it's been hit by other swords or where it's hit bones, that rust probably get, gets knocked off on a regular basis. All right. So that being said, you can see this other side is from another class I did, but uh, kind of the same effect. Just think about where does the rust form and then what comes behind the rust to kind of clean up the edge or, or resharpen the blade. Does that make sense? All right, so since I was a question about copper, I was planning on doing that anyway, but we'll go ahead and do that now. So what I'm going to do, this little plate up here, we're going to imagine that that's copper. Uh, there's one on each side. So obviously we could do it both ways. Um, we'll start with saying, I've already painted this copper and I'll take a little bit of this and I'm using the coppery orange. So let's just you know throw some paint on there. We'll let that dry and come back to it. Um, so after that's dry, we'll weather that. But let's think about a piece that we haven't yet painted and we know we want it to look weathered. Well, copper and you know some brasses and bronze mixes, uh, they'll actually uh, 
start the turns in, I think they call it uh, uh, vertigris. It'll have kind of a bluish color to it. Reaper actually makes it easy for us. There's a color called copper berry beads. So same kind of effect um, as we did on this one. I know I want this to look weathered and oak. So I'm gonna pit, I'm gonna paint this kind of based in this blue to start with, and then I will when it's dry, I will stipple the copper copper color over it. So since this side is dry, we'll go ahead and use this stippling brush. Same basic technique, different colors. We we'll just kind of stipple on some of this very grease color. And again, totally your preference on how weathered and, and tarnished you want it to look. But with uh, copper, you know, we were talking about the directionality of weathering and uh, let me hide a little edge here. Um, if you imagine water pouring down on this column, uh, the copper will actually start to drip down almost. The uh, So you take some of that very color and just very thinly add some lines as though the water has kind of drip this coppery color down and kind of tarnish the stone up underneath it a little bit here and there. Now again, less is more if you're doing competition pieces. You don't want to overdo it. Um, so hopefully you guys can see that the kind of streakiness going down. Um, but to kind of add to that effect, if you take some darker color, um, like the black and brown, and just very thinly uh, edge it down a little bit. It kind of help make that uh, red grease color kind of pop a little more and make, make it a little easier for your viewer to see. So hopefully you guys can see that. Now again, going back over to this side where we started with it, you know, the plan to weather it. We painted that verdigris color over there. Now we will stipple on some of this coppery orange. And you'll see you can get kind of the, the same effect. But again, copper and, and bronzes, they kind of leak their tarnish on the other things around them. So pulling down some, some just straight lines from that will kind of simulate where the water has ran off of this and then hit the, the column below it. Uh, all right, so true metallics versus non-metallics. Um, that's really a preference. Uh, the same technique will work on, on either. I will say that it's a little more difficult in my personal opinion to do non-metallic metal and then weather it uh, because you get the non-metallic metal effects from really good blends. Uh, so with that in mind, you might want to do a lot of thinking ahead of time of how do you, how do you sell that look of metal? Uh, so maybe do your non-metallic metal first, then weather it. But again, you're going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, trying to uh, stipple in non-metallic metal colors is not going to sell really well. It's not going to, you're not really going to get the effective metal that you try to get on non-metallic metal. True metallics, in my opinion, are a little easier on this. All right, so also, since we're talking about copper, um, let's talk about some other precious metals. So silver, when it tarnishes, it doesn't do like steel, it doesn't rust. And it doesn't turn this kind of bright, uh, very risk color like copper does. What silver will do is it will, um, it will darken um, eventually almost to a black color um, and have some blues in it as well. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put over here on my palette a little bit of black. Um, and a little bit of blue liner. And I've still got this, this lighter blue over here, um, which was Templar blue. So let's think for a minute um, that this little uh, sword piece right here in this, this column's hand is silver. So again, thinking about two ways, two approaches to do this, 
we could have pre-painted this silver. And again, if you're doing non-metallic metals, that's probably what you're going to want to do because reaching that effect of, oh yeah, that's metal with non-metallics is a whole different technique uh, that you're going to have to do first before you weather it. So while we let that dry, if you think about what I just said with it, you know, metal tarnishes uh, first, it turns kind of a blue color, then it gets a little darker blue, and then it gets black over time. So this one, I'm just going to paint it all black. And while we're waiting for those to dry, silver will also do the same thing as, as copper uh, with it kind of leaking its, its tarnish on the other things. So I'm just going to take some of this Templar blue and just kind of leak down some blue tarnish from that. We'll go ahead and do this on both sides. It just kind of helps sell that effect of, yep, water has been pouring over the silver and now this tarnish is down onto the rest of the column. So starting with this side that I painted silver. Um, now different than the, the metallics or the, the steel and the copper, silver tarnish is kind of in smooth patterns. So we don't really want to stipple, right? What we're going to do is, is get our brush damp, but not wet. So maybe just, uh, I do it on my sponge here and then I kind of wipe it off on my finger. We have a damp brush now. We're going to take some of that, uh, that blue liner and we're just kind of uh, put a little on there and just kind of you know, get your brush wet so you can kind of blend that in to kind of show Kind of a, an even pattern of bluing to the silver. So, and I realize that's kind of small. Hopefully, you guys can see that okay. And then again, as I was talking about, uh, it will have varying shades of blue on the silver. So, I'm going to use a little of that Templar blue and maybe lighten that up a little bit with the vetigers. And all I'm doing is putting very, very thin layers to kind of simulate, you know, some, some varying degrees of tarnish. So if you think about an old, um, like a teapot and, you know, the platter that it's on, it's been in somebody's house, you know, since, since grandmother was serving tea in the forties, um, you'll see those varying shades of blues and blacks across that silver. Going to this other side, if we were going to start, you know, right off the bat and know that we want tarnished silver, Kind of the same technique, we're just going to do it in reverse. So I've got my black there. I'm going to take a little of the blue liner and just kind of layer in a little bit. Now, while that's still wet, I'll take some, some of the lighter blues and just kind of increase the, the value a little bit. I may even pull some of it down. And then lastly, right around the edges, I'm going to grab some of this silver and just kind of let everybody know, yep, this is tarnished silver, just by picking at some of the edges and, and kind of blending it in as I go. Because silver, um, it to have a, a more uniform amount of tarnish uh, as opposed to some of the others. Uh, we're going to get to, to leather. Uh, so good question. Um, now, I'm not really going to show it, but gold uh, will do a very similar thing to the same technique as silver, uh, but gold tends to, to go a little more red than to brown, uh, and platinum does not tarnish. So if you're going to make a piece uh, for a competition and you want it to be platinum, make sure your judges know that you're showing platinum because tarnish, platinum does not exist, so you'll have some bright shining object right next to some rusty steel, and that will cause you to lose some points. All right, so we covered uh, some of the metals. What I want to cover next um, will be wood. But before I get started on that, uh, let me ask you some questions. Okay. All right, so to do that, I'm going to grab another piece um, that's got some metal on it. Let's pretend that this big flat surface is going to be silver. Um, CPO wash 
it can work for Chinese gold, but Chinese gold tends to be a little more red than sepia is. Um, so yeah, I would just kind of go on the red to brown spectrum and kind of avoid the sepia. But we are going to use sepia to watch for something else later. So to answer the uh, question running through the, the blue line of going up to silver, let's pretend that the top of this column is silver so you can see it a little better. I'll start with uh, kind of a black on there. And I'm kind of, since this is such a big area, I don't have to tarnish it all. So my brush a little wet, I'll grab some of the blue liner. I want some of that black to show. So I don't want to cover the entire area, the blue liner, just maybe 75, 80% of it. And then we'll continue to work our way up to the, the lighter blues. And the best way to do these precious metals is to do a Google search and find some tar tarnished silver, tarnished gold, um, copper, whatever, and just kind of emulate those patterns that you're seeing on the picture. Uh, but you'll see with silver, Kind of the key is just these varying levels of, of blueness. And it's just all kind of very smoothly tarnished as opposed to the stipple of steel. And you can keep doing this for a while. Uh, when you get done, when it's at a comfortable level, you go ahead and add some silver in there to let your your viewer or your you know your judge or whatever know that this is silver that is tarnished. And if you can see, I'm I'm all kind of wet blending this in uh, because again, silver and gold um, it's a lot more uniform and, and even. So I want this to kind of blend in together. All right, so hopefully that, that was helpful to the person that had that question. All right, so I'm gonna move right along. Um, let's see. And next we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do wood. Um, so obviously the piece that I have for the, the class doesn't have any wood on it. So if you have something with some wood or even something that you can just use to practice on, uh, that's you know, up to you if you use that or not. I happen to have a couple of barrels and boxes handy. So again, kind of from the, the spirit of, I've already painted this miniature. It's all, it looks like, uh, you know, wood planks. Um, but I want it to look old and weathered. So again, Reaper makes this a little bit easier for us um, because they have things like driftwood brown, for example, or brownwood browned. Um, wood, a lot of times when it's out in the weather, so think of an old uh, fence, you know, like a privacy fence that's been standing for probably 10 years too long. It will start to turn from that brown color to more of a, a lighter kind of a gray color to it. And that's what these are. So we'll start with the driftwood brown. And like we were doing on the silver, you want to think about how the water has been hitting, you know, that that wood. So if it's a fence that you're going, this is going to be kind of vertical lines, kind of running down this way, um, and that's what we'll kind of pretend. We'll, we'll we'll pretend that this box has been setting in this direction for a while. So the very top of it, most of that is going to be a lot lighter than this. So what I did is just loaded up my brush with this uh, driftwood brown, and um, this is a, a little bit wetter than a dry brush, but not quite a dry brush. Some, some people call it overbrushing. I'm just going to pick up those grains kind of in a single direction. And since this is the top of the box, I want most of that to be a lot lighter than the original brown. But I still want to show some of that grain in there so that everybody knows that it's wood. So the first step is just to lighten it up. And then down the sides, 
maybe a little less, especially in those recessed areas. I want to pick out the, the higher amounts first. And if you notice, I'm kind of leaving these areas kind of as they are for now. Because, you know, as the water is coming down this way, some of this might be missed. So I'll kind of skip over a little bit. To kind of show that there's an edge there. So as the water's coming down, it's protected a little bit. And the same thing here, there's an edge there. So I want to skip over a little bit and leave it dark there. We'll do the same thing on this side. So get your outside edges first, the ones that would have been wet a lot more. And again, I've just got enough paint on my brush to you know pick up the, the edges. Um, so think of dry brushing, but just with a little bit more paint. And then again, since there's an edge there, I want to leave a little bit of area that's not as worn, not as weathered. And kind of a growth across the grain so that we get all those nice sculpted in details. And you keep doing this to taste um, with just this color, first of all. So I've done two sides on the top. Now for me, I think that this top is going to be a lot lighter than that. So I'm going to take some linen white or any kind of off-white color and just kind of lighten up that uh, drifted brown just a little bit. So about a one-to-one -one mix. And then this even less paint, so a little bit closer to a dry brush consistency. I'm just going to kind of pick up some of the edges kind of going across the grain. So this box has been sitting on some dock for you know six months or so. Some dock worker in your campaign has not been very good about doing his job and getting this one to the warehouse. So it's it's a little bit more weathered. So you can see now we have two layers on there. But what next will happen to wood is it it starts to grow moss on. Um, so using some kind of a, a medium green color, this is Highland moss. Uh, any of the lighter greens will, will do this trick. Um, and then we're going to use a kind of a darker green. This is mossy green. So we want to do both of these. So again, if you think about the privacy fence, you know, in, in somebody's backyard that's that's about 10 years past when it should have been replaced, it starts to get moss on it. Now it's going to get moss, um, you know, not all over it, right? You don't want to cover it. But for me, I'm going to do the moss kind of at the bottom of you know the wood. So this is the top. I'm going to start with that darker green using my stippling brush. I'm just going to stipple in some of that darker green on the bottom. So it looks like you know maybe this was uh, waterlogged a little bit and that allowed the moss to form on it. Now, in real life, um, moss could form just about anywhere. Um, and since this is a gaming piece, I want I want people to know that that's moss. So I'm not going to put it, you know, on the top or on the you know upper parts of it. I just want it to look like this has been setting in a place that's been repeatedly wet. And once I've stippled in enough of this dark green, then I'll I'll go right into the uh, the lighter green and do just a little bit of it, not covering, not, not completely hiding that dark green. But that way we kind of get a mossy look on the bottom of the wood. Now, hopefully my cameras are showing this, this color very well. To me on my screen, it looks all about the same color, but um, when you're doing this kind of on your own, you'll notice kind of a gradient going from this darker green up through the lighter green, then to the lighter woods, and then on up. So one other thing you'll see with wood occasionally where water has been running down, you'll get kind of some streaks. So if I take uh, maybe some of this blackened brown, you might have some, you might want to show some streaks in there. 
just to kind of hint at there's been some running water in there. This will also add contrast to your piece and allow you to reclaim any of those shadows that you may have accidentally stippled over. So just kind of sparingly uh, put some darker lines on there to kind of show that there has been some liquid going down it. So if you wanted to do a larger piece like this, you could do the same technique, but the stippling would take you forever. So I'm gonna just uh, take a bigger brush and, and just kind of dry brush over it. That lighter wood color. And notice I'm doing this fairly quickly. Uh, if you're doing a competition piece, you might want to, you know, take your time on a little bit more than this. Um, and just like we did on the other, I'm gonna after I've done that, I'm gonna lighten that up a little bit with the the linen white. And just about a dry brush consistency. I'm just gonna hit some areas of it, not all of it, because I want other colors to shine through. And then we gotta get some more of this dark green here. And now I'm gonna switch to my stippling brush and add some kind of mossy look at the bottom of it. Once I've got enough of this dark green kind of stippled in there, I'll go right into the light green without cleaning my brush. And that'll give you, you know, some variance in the colors because moss isn't usually even in its color. And then just like we did on the little box, to kind of sell the idea that water has been running down, so imagine this has been sitting on some beach somewhere. I'm gonna grab my black and brown and I'll thin it out a little bit. And maybe just draw some, some little runs where maybe there's been water running down. And since this is a boat, maybe we can combine things. Maybe there's some nails up underneath of there um, that have been rusting. So let's imagine that hole has a nail in it. We can add some of these orange colors and our rust colors from the steel and just kind of add some thin lines showing where something oh, that one's a little big something metal has rusted through there as well all right so that's uh the general weathering of wood all right any questions on wood Okay, then we will move on to leather. Um, so again, on this, uh, I selected this piece because of RVE, because of the cyberpunk things, but there's no leather on this. So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna grab one of these handy orcs here, and he happens to have a, a quiver on his back. So this one is pre-painted, uh, use some of the like polished leathers and things like that to get this leather look. Um, and also his belt here. Now leather, if it's just kind of raw tanned leather, what it will do is it will start to, to turn a little orange. Uh, and then eventually where like buckles hit or things get worn down, you'll have some white. So it's a very similar technique uh, than all that we've been doing, but we are gonna use, I'm gonna grab this oiled leather to kind of help out a little bit, a little of the explosion of orange and a little linen white. Grab a brush with a decent tip on it. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect because it's not real fine work. And what I want to do, I want to kind of blend this. So I'm going to paint some of this oiled leather over this quiver and over this belt. And then like I was saying, leather, where, where it starts to, to wear down, it will start to turn a little bit orange. Now, again, we're talking about tanned leather, not, not like dyed leather, like boots. Um, 
but it starts to turn a little bit orange. But again, you want that leather to shine through. You don't want to completely overwhelm it with the orange color. And then at the edges where things are rubbing, it'll start to have kind of a white edge. So think of a, a worn out pair of work boots. Um, the toes will you know, start to, to turn a little orange, and then you'll have some white cracking. So on this belt, we're going to imagine that he's he's had some things kind of rubbing on it here and there. We're just going to put some little white lines to show that kind of cracking. Maybe blend in some oranges. And the more you lighten up that, that leather color with the oranges, the more weathered it's going to look. But it's very easy to overdo it with leather. Um, you don't want his belt to eventually look like he's wearing a, a piece of orange cloth. So going back around to this front side, I'll do this again so you can see it a little better. You see there's a leather strap coming down there. There's a, a piece of leather there. First, we'll hit it with the oiled leather, which is a lighter brown color. And we'll add in some of the oranges. And then if you look here, he's got some kind of drawstrings that are tying that together. That's where you would get some of that white kind of cracking. So I'm, I'm just using linen, linen white. And I'm just going to pick out some, some worn patterns there where he's uh, things are rubbed up against it, scratched it, whatever. So same thing on this, this bigger belt up here. I'm going to add some of the oiled leather. A little bit of the orange. And at the edges, just a little bit of the, the white to kind of show where it's where it's been rubbing up against things. All right, so the general concept to tan leather is to just use the uh, you know the oranges, the whites, and then some lighter leather color uh, to kind of sell the effect. But the thing to keep in mind is to, to think about where things are rubbing. So if you notice like this dagger here that's hanging from his belt, it's probably not always in that position. So I'm going to add in a little bit of, you know, white kind of scuff marks to show where, you know, he put, he's put the dagger in there and maybe he sliced into his belt a few times. And then kind of, kind of wear it out a little bit there with the, the whites and the orange. To kind of show where that, that dagger's kind of went back and forth in there and maybe it scratched his belt as he's went through. Same thing kind of on the other side, but I don't want to lose my shadow here, so I'm just going to kind of peck at a little bit of white there to kind of simulate that. So does that make sense for leather? Any questions on that? Okay. Well, since we're talking about leather, let's talk about cloth and fur. And we're going to use the same work figure. Um, again, if you're trying to paint along at home, just grab anything that has cloth on it. Um, you can do the same kind of effect. Um, wet leather, um, to, to make it look wet, um, really all you would do, uh, when leather gets wet, it darkens. Um, so you would take like maybe the black and brown and just kind of glaze over it. Now, the problem with wet leather is you're going to have to make the rest of the miniature look wet. Uh, and maybe even add some water effects to, to let your viewer or your, your judge or whatever know that that's what you're trying to do. Because if you just do this, it's it's not going to look like, you know, you're trying to make wet leather. It's going to look like you, you kind of messed up doing leather. Uh, but all you would do is just kind of take some, maybe some black and brown. Because leather, when it gets wet, it just darkens. You want to thin that out really good and just kind of glaze over it to darken the leather. Now, again, if I were doing this and I wanted it to look wet, that's a great question, by the way. Um, and I really wanted to sell that this is wet. When this is all dry, we go over it with uh, maybe Reaper's gloss sealer uh, to show that it's shiny and wet. Um, and I may also add some water effects, like some dripping water, you know, from, from parts of them to kind of show that, yeah, he's getting soaked in the rain. But yeah, that's an entirely different subject that, uh, you know, um, we cover that a little bit in my water effects class that I teach sometimes. 
a good question. All right, so if we're going to talk about cloth, and I don't have a lot to work with here, but you can kind of get the idea. So cloth, the simplest way to explain that is, is think about a worn out pair of uh, long blue jeans that they've been hitting the ground. You know, you've been walking around, they, they overhang the back of your shoes, and they start to uh, start to get a little white where it's fraying out. So that's kind of the same thing we want to do. Take that linen white and just kind of add in some textured looks on the cloth of where basically the color has worn completely off of it and it started to fray. So if you notice what I'm doing, I'm, I've got a brush here that's got kind of a flat edge on it. I'm just kind of adding some lines in here and there and then I'm going to alternate that brush to kind of give it a little bit of a textured pattern. And that, that will kind of start to show again on this fur, kind of the same thing. Just the bottom edges of it as it starts to, to wear down just at the edges is going to become lighter colored. So on this piece, all I did was take the linen white and do that. But also you'll have some kind of mud looks um, where it's kind of dirty and dingy. So over that, I'm going to take this black and brown, thin it out quite a bit, and just kind of glaze in sparingly some areas where it looks uh, not so bright white and it looks a little dingy. So same thing on the fur. And again, you'll kind of have to eyeball the piece. So think about this um, this pack on his, or this quiver on his back. It's probably going to start to fray this fur up a little bit. So I'm going to put some of these white marks under it to show where that's been kind of rubbing it and causing that color to, to disappear, making it a little more white on the edges. And then dingy it up with some thinned out dark brown. So cloth, the best way to do it is to try to show the texture is what I'm trying to say. So this red right here, just gonna put some, just some very sparing white lines. Again, we wanna show a texture because we don't want this to look like bad highlights. We want it to look like worn cloth. I'm making little bitty X's. It's probably hard to see on the camera. And then kind of dingy it up with that brown to simulate maybe some mud has gotten on the bottom of it as it's been trampled through the forest. <clears throat> All right, so cloth is, is kind of a difficult thing to weather uh, because it's difficult to sell. That's what you're doing. Uh, and very, very easy to overdo it. So I would think in this regard, less is more. If you notice at the bottom of it, uh, I kind of you know, made those little uh, white marks to kind of show the texture. And then I kind of glazed over that with a kind of a darker brown to kind of show that it's muddy. That's about the best you can do with cloth because if you try to do more, you're, um, so let's assume it's a competition piece. The judge most likely is just gonna think that you have really messed up on your highlights. Now, if it's for a tabletop uh, game piece, obviously you can do whatever you want to, to give the effect that you want for you know your weekend games. All right, so let's move back to our our piece here. <clears throat> what I want to do now is kind of think about okay, a lot of this has been weathered, um, but let's think about some more things that have happened to it. Um, let's where we're going to talk about now is scratches and dents. <clears throat> So what I want to do is show that not only has this been weathered, it's been used and it's been in battles. So a color I like to use for this is uh, nightshade purple and linen white. You can also use uh, any dark color like black and, and true silver if you want. But for me, it's just easier to use the linen white because the line is going to be so thin that that silver will look kind of gray. Um, and what I want to do up here uh, on his little legs here, I want to show maybe he's uh, banged his leg up against something as he was chasing after somebody and it's called scratch. So when you think about scratches, this is going all the way down to the metal 
you know, scraping off the rust, scraping off the paint. You want to think about how your light source is hitting and where that light source is coming from. If you're trying to create the illusion of like a divot, um, there's going to be a dark side of that where the light is missing. And then, you know, the light is catching on some other edge. So the way we do that is I'm going to take this nightshade purple, a brush with a pretty good point on it, and I'm just going to make a couple of lines across there to kind of simulate the shadow part of, you know, some deep scratch. But the way to make that look like a scratch is you think about the light, you know, coming down, it's going to catch on the opposite edge, right? So the bottom edge is going to catch the light on that scratch. So taking a brush with a pretty decent point on it, I'm going to try to paint right over the bottom half of that nightshade purple. A very thin line. To kind of simulate a scratch on that, that lower leg. Hopefully you guys can see that. Now let me do it up on top, maybe it'll be a little easier to see. Now on top's a little harder because, you know, you got your light source coming down. Well, it's gonna be difficult to catch a shadow and a light there. So you're just gonna to have to kind of simulate it. I'm gonna put a scratch this way. So I'll take the nightshade purple and just draw a couple of scratch lines in there. And then since the light is coming down this way, I can pick either side. And I'm going to take this white and try to make a very thin line uh, right next to her or on top of that nightshade purple. To just kind of show that there's there's two edges. One is light, one is dark. The key to this is you want to kind of have those kind of uniform so that whoever is looking at this can tell that, yep, that's a scratch. All right, so to show you this a little bit better, on maybe a surface you can see better, let's go back to our work here. We'll put a, a couple of scratches here on this sword. Again, light shade purple, followed by a very thin line of the white. It's a little thicker than I want it to be. So you want to keep those lines fairly, fairly small, uh, as thin as you can make them. One secret to uh, making thin lines, in addition to have a brush that's got a pretty decent point on it, is to make sure your paint is kind of thin. Thin paint flows a little bit better uh, than thick paint. Uh, with thicker paint, it's very easy, um, you know, to go a little too far with a scratch. So let me do a scratch on this side. Uh, so just the nightshade purple, and then come all the way down. Kind of a thin line. And then, you know, with a wet brush, grab just a little bit of that white and try to do a very thin line right next to, but on the bottom of the nightshade purple. You can make that kind of line there. And that kind of shows that there's a deep scratch on his leg. Dents would work about the same. Um, you just have to think about, okay, what part is recessed and not catching light and what part is catching light? So let's put a dent right here. We'll take the nightshade purple and we'll just kind of paint on a little divot. And then we'll think about where does the light hit, All right? Well, it's going to hit on this edge because if you think about, you know, a dent on your car, there's a little bit of an edge at the top before it starts to go down and then down at the bottom, there'll be a little bit of light hitting that as well. So just trying to make a little circular motion, leaving most of that in shadow, it kind of looks like there's a dent there. Same kind of thing, but very small on bullet hose. I'm gonna take the, the nightshade purple and we'll put this right here. We'll see that he gets shot. So I'm just gonna put a dot there, put a couple of them. And then every one of those is just going to have just a little bit of light catching the edges. 
So take just a little bit of the white. I have a little too much water on my brush. And just kind of dot in, leaving a lot of the purple because you want it to look like a hole. Just kind of put a little white dot next to it to show where the light is catching just the edge of that bullet hole. I realize this is really small to see on, on the cameras, but hopefully you can see that I've got a dark spot with just a light dot in the middle of it to simulate the bullet hole. All right, time check. All right, pretty good on time. All right, so let's think about some additional types of not just weathering, but what else happens in kind of the line of duty of a service robot. What I want to show next is uh, if you notice on this piece, there are some kind of uh, hydro hydraulic looking, you know, parts that are moving around. There's probably oil flowing from those. So what I'm going to do is take some of this black. And if you think about oil, it's not just black. It have a little touch of blue in it. So I'm just going to take a little black, a little bit of blue, and make a color that's very similar to coal black. Um, and I'm going to thin this out quite a bit. And if you see these kind of like um, hydraulic rams here, I want to have like leaky seals. So I'm just going to drip down some of this thinned out black blue color around these hydraulic lines to make it look like you know the seals are a little worn out and again just like we did on the the column with the uh, precious metals that that oil is just going to kind of drip down maybe it hits his his foot here and maybe we just put some little dots of oil on the base to show where this this oil has been leaking out and dripping so a little, uh, little black and a little bit of dark blue will kind of simulate the oil for you. But yeah, he's he's leaking from all of these little joints because he's just so worn out and not well maintained. So maybe even around his, his arms, he's got some oil leaking. And maybe at the back of these turrets, I'm gonna have a little bit of oil streaks coming down. So all it is is a thinned out color. Now, maybe in the past, there's been an oil line that, that's ruptured. And we want to show on the base kind of like some splatter. So all we're going to do is take this, this black-blue mix and thin it way down with water. Now, this gets a little messy. Um, so you do want to protect this area a little bit. So all I want to do here is, is show like some oil splatter. I've thinned out this black and blue paint. I'm going to take two brushes. Do a test spray there. And all I'm going to do is just kind of flick some oil on the base to make it look like there's a kind of a splatter. Now, this same technique would work with mud. So let's, uh, let's grab our handy little orc here. And let's say that you know he's been tromping around in the mud. So I'll kind of grab some of these brown colors. Maybe a little driftwood brown mixed with a little bit of black and brown. And then thin that with water, a couple of test sprays, and then just kind of flick this towards the base. Angles are everything. And then I kind of simulate a little bit of mud splatter on him. And maybe even over on this robot, there's some mud that's splattered around. All right, so hopefully you can kind of see that. Now with oil, oil is shiny. Um, so what we're going to do to simulate that is to grab our gloss sealer. And just kind of lightly go over those oil slicks so that, uh, you know, whoever's looking at this knows that that's some kind of wet liquid. And not just you know shadows or or something else you know you want to be able to let people know instantly looking at it that that surface right there in that spot is wet that black line is not a dent it's not a divot it's not some bad attempt at a shadow 
it's purposely done oil that is spilled out of this robot because the maintenance guys just aren't doing their job. All right. So any question on oil and mud splatters? Uh, <laughs> Max, maybe you took my class last night. Yeah, we did the same thing with blood on uh, realistic horror. Um, and yeah, with blood, if you wanted to do that kind of splatter, you just change the color. If you wanted to do acid, you could use some bright green. Um, just use your imagination, whatever color the liquid is, you can do that same kind of effect. Just kind of thin it out and, and flick it. All right, so we're doing pretty good on time. So the next thing I want to do, um, I want to show you uh, scorched chrome. So you think about the uh, exhaust pipe on some motorcycle. And you can actually purchase um, pre-scorched chrome tailpipes for, for most motorcycles. Um, but what I want to show is kind of thinking about a barrel that has been overheated, like his turrets here. He's fired so many shots that they've overheated and scorched. It's a pretty easy technique. So you think about scorched metal. Um, you're going to have kind of a, almost kind of a rainbow of colors, but they tend to be more reds and blues. Um, so I'm going to grab some of these Reaper clear colors. And what I've got is kind of a rainbow of colors here. <laughs> I've got clear yellow. Uh, clear magenta, clear red, clear blue, and clear purple. And what we're going to do is scorch in barrels, just the tips of them. And the way we're going to do that, let me get my paper towel back up here. We're going to do kind of an, you know, I'm going to have to go kind of fast on this because we want to wet blend these as we go. So I'm going to do one barrel. It's going to seem a little fast, but don't worry. We'll do the other barrel as well. So first, we're going to get our colors out. And you kind of think in almost in terms of the, the rainbow. Um, so purple and a little bit of blue. And maybe magenta. And red. And maybe yellow. Need to shake this up a little bit. All right, so these Reaper clears work pretty good for this, um, but other colors would work good as well. Just in my opinion, these these work out better for this this effect. So, what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to wet blend this as we go. So, a couple of different ways to do this. First, we can just take water and just wet, make the barrel wet. That's one way. But if we do it with just water, we're going to have to move pretty quick. So what I want to use is um, we've got some uh, drying retarder uh, that Reaper makes. What this will do is help the paint act a little bit more like oil paints. It will slow down the drying time. So rather than use the water, we're going to use the drying retarder and just kind of paint the barrel with the drying retarder. And that gives us a little bit more working time with our paints. Now, in order, I'm going to take the purple and just kind of, not too much, just kind of lightly glaze over because we want that chrome to show through. We're just kind of lightly glazing that purple on. We'll immediately move to the blue and covering about half of the purple, but leaving some of the blue. We'll jump right to the magenta. Again, you're covering a little bit of the blue, leaving some of the magenta. And we'll go straight to the red. And as you can see, these are kind of blending together because of that retarder that I've got. And then right at the edge, we do a little bit of yellow. Now, right now it doesn't, doesn't really sell the effect to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that drying retarder 
and load my brush up with that. And then I'm just going to kind of try to blend these edges together to make it a little bit more smooth of a transition. And if you notice, like on mine, one of the colors kind of went away, the magenta is pretty thin. I can try to add that back in and just kind of blend it over. But what you want to do is have kind of a nice even blend um, that kind of goes from that yellow through the red, through the magenta, through the blue, and into the purple at the tip. And this barrel is really small to work with. So the drying retarder allows us the time to kind of fool with these blends. Because if we didn't use it, the, this paint would have already dried and we would have had some really rough edges in there. The thing we really want to uh, stress here is you want your chrome to shine through all of those colors. So you want to keep it fairly thin. But then again, you do want to kind of show that that new color. So if you can look at this, hopefully it's showing up OK on the camera. You get that scorched metal look uh, after these colors are blended together. Let me try to get this a little closer. Might have to adjust my focus. So you guys can see that okay? Does that help, Jason? All right, so let me do the other one and I'll try to stay pretty close to this camera. It will be a little difficult um, for me to do uh, because of the angle. But let's do the other barrel. And maybe you guys can see a little bit better what I'm talking about. So I'm going to take that drying retarder and just kind of coat the barrel in it. Right. And then it's a little difficult to do at this angle, but we're going to start with the purple on the tip. And we're going to march into the blue. Into the magenta. Go to the red. And then to the yellow, which the yellow is very hard to see. But in real life, you can see it. I just don't know how well it's showing up. So you can see there's too many distinct lines in here. I think I'm off camera. Adjust my focus a little bit. So you can see these like really hard lines. The way to get rid of that is to just kind of load up your brush with that drying retarder. And you can kind of start to blend those in, those edges. And you may lose one color, like I just lost some of the purple, so you just grab a little bit more of that. And basically, you just keep blending until you get kind of an even gradient across there. And it is really difficult for me to see at this angle. So hopefully it's working. All right, so hopefully you guys get that concept of what we're doing here. All right, so that's kind of scorched metal. Now, that those are nice long barrels. And actually, I want to continue this down on the side. A little bit here, a little bit there. And to the blue, into the magenta. Get back on my little dot. And let me get my side camera and focus again. Now, the thing is with Chrome, um, you also want to have your shadows shown in there pretty well. So with Chrome, what you'll have is kind of a, you'll have a, a light color right next to a dark color. So let's go back to that nightshade purple that we were using. And we're just going to draw a very thin line straight down the barrel through all those colors. 
because Chrome is going to be reflecting things around it. But it's also going to have these kind of very bright light source edges next to the dark. And what we're doing is adding those back in by using the nightshade purple and the, the off-white. A little bit too much white there. To kind of show that, yeah, this is still chrome. And if you can see, I'm using a very thin glaze of this white. And as it's going over the colors, it's just kind of lightening them up a little bit. It's not really making them white. Um, but that's how you give it the effect of it's not painted chrome, it's scorched chrome. All right, so. So any question on the, uh, the scorched chrome before I move on? Okay, so before we get too far away from that, he's also got these smaller barrels. Now with a smaller space, making that scorch is gonna be pretty difficult. So the way to simulate that is just to take uh, kind of your extremes. I'm gonna take the purple and I'm gonna take the red and put two very thin lines there. And then just kind of using that drying retarder, I'm just gonna kind of blend those together in a very, very short space. Um, because this shorter barrel, there's not a lot of it there to show that kind of scorched look. So you can kind of just simulate it. But it kind of gives the, the piece uniformity uh, without kind of going over the top, if that makes sense. All right, last thing we're gonna to wanna to do on these barrels, since we played around so much with them, we want to go ahead and show that there is a hole still where, you know, the round is coming out. And since I slathered that purple all over it, I'm going to take a little bit of silver and I'm just going to kind of reclaim the edge at the end here. Now, a lot of weathering, you end up, you know, hiding things that you don't want to hide. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm kind of making this look again like a barrel. Uh, same thing with this one. I kind of lost my black in there. Hold. So just going back and kind of reclaiming the edges uh, using just a little bit of silver, uh, kind of over brushing at the edges. To just kind of show that, you know, there is, that is still a barrel. It's still capable of firing. All right, and after class, I'll take some, some more detailed photographs of this and put it on my artist channel so that you guys can see more in detail how we did this. All right, so now that we've done wood and cloth, and leather, various types of metals, I also want to talk about stone a little bit. Now, given, um, you know, the class description didn't talk about this, but I like to uh, show a variety of materials. So if you have something laying around that you can use to simulate stone and you want to practice this, that's fine. If not, you can just kind of follow along and take some notes and ask some good questions. So what, what I've got here is just kind of a base coated rough idea of stone, right? It's not very, you know, detailed at all, but we want to weather that. So stone, a lot of times, so think about an old cemetery. Um, you know, some of the graves from say the 1800s. What you'll see is a uh, stone will blacken um, at, at times. It will also have moss growing on it. And we've already kind of done these effects. So it's kind of the same technique. What we're going to do using our trusty homemade stippling brush, we're going to take some black and just kind of stipple in some areas that have blackened over time. So also if you uh, live in a, an older city, you'll notice this on a lot of the sidewalks. That, that just kind of blackened, uh, dingy look that they get over time. 
and it'll be really random. You'll have some areas that, you know, some areas that are uh, completely solidly dark colored and other areas will have uh, kind of a speckled look too. Now here's the, the challenge with stone. You don't want this to look like bad shape, which is what it does right now. Well, stone will also get a little mossy. So we're gonna take some of that dark green and just to kind of try to sell that we are weathering and not bad people at shading. We're gonna add some of this mossy look in on this stone. And again, if you're thinking about old sidewalks, I know here in Louisville, uh, in you know the older part of the city, you walk down some of those uh, sidewalks around those beautiful Victorian homes and the sidewalks have this kind of weird mossy black mix on them. They leave those sidewalks like that because uh, it kind of validates that those homes are 200 years old. Uh, so with the same as we did the moss on the wood, we're going to use the dark green uh, followed by a lighter green. And again, I'm using highland moss and mossy green, but you could use meadow green. You could use a, um, you could even use alien goo if you wanted to really have some con contrast in there. But just varying shades of green will give you kind of a mossy look. Now, most stone will have kind of a speckled look about it. Um, as you're doing this moss on things, that's why I'm stippling, because the surface of the stone is not smooth. It's not like like wood, where you would have kind of a, a more runny look kind of to the moss. The surface of the stone, you want to show it texture, and that's why we're stippling all this on. So once you get where you think you're comfortable with that, we still want to sell that this is stone. Uh, so I've got, you know, kind of a, a nice little gradient going on here with different mosses, different blacks. But to me, it's not really reading as stone yet. So here's what we want to think about. Um, you want to think about where things have, have rubbed up against the stone. Maybe. And maybe you take, a, you know, a little bit of your white, a little bit of uh, black, make a, a medium gray, and just kind of reclaim some of those edges to kind of give it that you know, that, that kind of rough stony look, but stone still does have an edge, right? So you want to capture the edge by reclaiming some of the light that you just, you know, put moss and, and black marks all over. Also stone, a lot of times will have cracks in it. So if we take some of our black and, and thin it out quite a bit because we want to have a nice flow. We're just going to kind of freehand some cracks Now, similar to the scratches and the dents that we did, if we have a crack, we're going to have a shadowed edge and an edge that's catching light. So on these cracks, think about your light source coming down. It's going to hit the light's going to hit the opposite side of the light source, and that's kind of how you'll, you'll paint in some some cracks if they're not already sculpted in there. Now let's put a crack across here. Maybe the crack. Oh, there's one sculpted in. It worked out good. So again, it's the light source is catching on the bottom edge of the crack. Anyway, that's uh the basics of weathering stone. Now, for me, on this green, it really didn't come out as mossy as I want. So I'm going to grab one of these brighter greens. And I'm going to use Alien Goo. Again, a lot of weathering is just kind of standing back and looking and then making that mental decision of, is it giving you the idea that you want to portray? So for me, my moss colors didn't really do it for me. So I'm going to take a little Alien Glue and just kind of very lightly and very sparingly add some a little bit of contrast to this to kind of, kind of boost up that green color just a little bit. So my opinion, um, this mossy green, let me zoom in a little bit here for you. 
adding that that brighter green kind of helped the moss look um, it also kind of helped give it a little more textured look all right uh questions or comments on stone okay let's go next to uh weathered bone um, so Reaper makes a whole ton of different bone colors, bone shadow, polished bone, you know, yellowed bone. There's, there's a ton of them. You can use any one of these. I happen to be able to grab uh, skull and crossbones pretty quickly. But any one of the bone colors as a base would work. And what we're going to do, you see these little skulls here. We're going we're gonna to age a few of those. So let me paint a few of them, just kind of a basic bone color. And I just happen to be using skull and crossbones. But, you know, uh, dirty bone is actually my favorite, but I believe that's discontinued now. Um, but any of the bone colors would work for this. And obviously, you know, here in class, I'm not going to do all of these you know, 13 skulls or whatever's around this column, uh, but just enough for us to, to kind of practice on them. And all I'm doing is, is just kind of a an overbrush, so just above a dry brush, uh, because I did kind of zenithal paint this, and so a lot of these skulls have already got some, some decent shading on them. So I don't want to hide all of that, but I'm just kind of overbrushing the basic bone color on them. And then down here, there's a lot of skulls too. I'm just going to kind of use what's left on my brush and just kind of dry brush those in. All right, so from, from right now, at this starting point, um, actually, let me, uh, just to help it out, I'm going to add in some black on these eye sockets. Because I get a little rambunctious with my uh, bone color. let that dry just a second um but what we have here at the start is you know it's it looks a little too polished right so we've got this whole column is is really weathered up uh it looks like it's been out you know in the middle of the graveyard honoring you know fallen heroes or whatever it is you know for, for millennia uh but then there's all these bright you know crystal gleaming skulls on it and that really doesn't look uh you know all that weathered or doesn't fit the, the rest of the column. Uh, by the way, Boswell, you are in fact wrong. Um, according to Ando the Great, uh, the root Targi are the rulers of the universe. All right, so somebody was talking about sepia. So I'm going to use sepia liner. Um, that works really good for the very quick and easy uh, bone weathering. Because bones, so think about the bones that you see in, in say, some archaeology show. And no comments from the Arcos, please, um, <clears throat> about the, the, you know, weathered bones that you guys have dug up across the universe. But uh, the sepia liner actually helps kind of yellow and dingy up that, that bone really easily. So again, what I'm going to do, since this is dry, I've got a wet brush here. I'm just going to just going to kind of go over these skulls with just a wet brush to make them a little bit damp. And then I'm going to take my sepia liner and starting at the edges of the bone, I'm going to add a little sepia liner. Then I'm going to wet my brush. There's still a little sepia liner on here, but this brush is a little bit wet. And I'm just going to kind of pull this sepia liner out towards the rest of the bone. So leaving it more consolidated at the edges. Let me do that again. So I put the sepia liner on kind of straight right at the edges. And then wet my brush. I'm, I'm just doing it here on my wet palette on the sponge. I just want to kind of wet blend that sepia liner to kind of pull that around the bone to make it look a little more weathered. So if you look at, say, this one, versus this bright white one, there's a considerable difference. Now you'll want to keep doing this until you have kind of a consistent 
uh, blend of the sepia liner over the bone. Um, and it will take a few layers. So what I'm going to do is just continue around the rest of the skull that I did here, putting the sepia liner right at the edge first, and then using a damp brush to kind of pull that towards the lighter areas of the bone. That will start to, it's the first step in weathering a bone. Because it does tend to turn kind of a, a sepia color as it ages. All of these right here. And again, you'll have to keep kind of eyeballing it where it seems like you've got too much sepia. You just get your brush wet again and you can kind of push that back towards the edges. Because you do want some of that bone color to, to remain but most of it, you want sepia. So down here in this big field here, I'm just gonna thin out some sepia liner and just gonna glaze over this, this whole area. Then wet my brush and you can see, I could kind of pull that sepia into the recesses. So it's not all one color, it's, it gives you kind of a gradient effect. I'm back up here to the top. You have to kind of keep playing with the bone. They get it to the, the you know right consistency that, that you feel good with. And all I'm doing is taking a little sepia liner, putting it on, and then wetting my brush to kind of push that around. Because what I want to do is have, you know, where the the sunlight and whatever has been hitting this, maybe the water, it's going to be a little bit lighter. And where it's been protected a little bit, it's going to be a little bit more the sepia color. Now, once that's done, um, you want to go ahead and, and add in some shadows because you can see that sepia is kind of around the edges now. It's kind of flowed onto the stone. We're going to go ahead and reclaim that. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this uh, nightshade purple and just going to very lightly draw a line around the skull. And then same kind of effect. I'm going to take a wet brush. Still got a little too much paint on and just gonna push that, that nightshade purple around the skull to kind of give it back the contrast that it had when it began. And what I'm doing is really hiding the uh, sepia liner that they got onto the stone. And again, you just kind of play around with the, the water versus the uh, nightshade purple, staying off the skulls. It kind of just reclaims and, and gives you back your contrast and gives you that, that difference between stone and, and the skulls. So same thing on the bottom edge. If you notice, I got a little bit of sepia liner right here on the stone, I want to hide that. So I'll go in with the nightshade purple. And I'll use a little bit of water to kind of push that in tighter around the skulls. And same thing on this bottom edge where, where I've accidentally hit the edges with the sepia. I don't want the sepia line on, on the stone. So just kind of reclaim that shadow. Then once all that's said and done, you still want some highlights in there, right? Because now it's, it's a little too uniform. What I'm going to do is take a little touch of the sepia liner, put it over on the side of my palette, uh, grab a little bit of that bone color, say kind of a one-to-one -one mix. And then I'm going to kind of overbrush where my highlights are hitting on the stone with kind of a, a lighter sepia color to kind of get some of the highlights back that are covered with this technique. Again, we don't want to go full on bone colored because that would that would take a, away from what we just did, but we do want to reclaim some of our highlights that we had. So one to one mix of sepia and the bone color that you used, and then over brush or just barely above a dry brush to kind of just reclaim some of those edges. So you're left with something that, that looks like older bone. And when we go back over here. 
Hopefully you guys can see those colors. All right, does that make sense for, for bone? Any question on bone? Uh, you're welcome, Leva. I really enjoy teaching uh, these classes. And again, uh, as most of you know, I'm not some legendary painter or anything like that. Um, I just happen to be okay at a whole lot of things. Um, so with uh, weathering, uh, to me, for my, my weekly games, I like to have things that, that kind of fit the genre or kind of set a mood. So if I'm running like a graveyard scene, and on this side that I haven't painted at all, if I set that piece out on the table, I mean, yeah, it works and it serves the purpose of the game. But this this side here, if I had the whole thing painted like that and I had a bunch of tombstones of the game, it changes the whole mood and feel of the game for me and for my players. Um, they really appreciate it. So that's kind of why I started getting into weathering. And the more I learned about it, the more I enjoyed it. And as you know, fate would have it, um, a lot of people like the way that I do it, so that's why I started teaching this class. All right, so now I've got something else that I want to kind of show you guys, and I'm going to have to move through it fairly quickly. Um, now, this involves a little bit more of a technique. So let's say you're working on a larger piece. I want to get some of this stuff out of the way. Let's say you're working on, say, a, uh, you know, an entry for the uh, MSP Open Ordnance Division. And you've got a larger piece, like say a vehicle. Now we've already went over the, the steps that got me to this point, right? All I've done is started with a, a basic brown and I've stippled in some of the, the random other colors. But this is a very large area and it would take me forever to stipple in you know, that paint that I want to have showing through. And I wanna have a, a really weathered looking entry. Now I've actually got tape over the, the glass parts of this. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're doing, say, like a model car or, say, a Gundam or something, anything that you don't want to have this weather on, you want to protect it. But what I'm going to show you is kind of a cool technique that I learned. Um, and this actually got me a silver medal in one of the MSP opens, uh, just using this technique here. I'm going to use salt uh, to get some weather. So obviously, everybody knows to get to this point, right? We, we went over that in class a couple of times. So what I'm going to do with the salt, I'll take a fairly thick brush. And again, one that I don't really care about too much. This is a craft brush. It's not going to hurt anything. I'm going to get it wet. Um, I'm not even going to wipe it off, really. You can see it's, it's almost dripping. And where I want most of my rust to be concentrated, I'm going to get that surface wet. And don't worry, I'll do this a couple of times. So you guys can see it. All right, then I'm going to take this salt. And this is just regular coarse salt that you can get at the grocery store. I think I paid 98 cents for a lifetime supply of this stuff. I'll put it in my hand like that. Uh, now, note, if for, I have a weird allergy against uh, cotton. So if you have some allergy against salt, don't do this with a glove. But all I want to do is take my fingers and kind of, grind that coarse salt up so that I have different levels of flake, right? So some are thick, some are, are huge, you know, some are almost dust. Now you see where all this water is. I'm going to sprinkle that salt under that water. Now I've messed around explaining that so much that a lot of my water has dried, so I'm going to add some more. And I'm just going to sprinkle this salt directly onto those areas, paying close attention to where I want the most of the rest to be, because the salt is actually going to protect that um, um, that area when I paint it. Now there are other products that you can get out there that do the same thing, right? But those other products are not 98 cents for a lifetime supply. The salt works perfectly fine for this. Now, rotating this to the side, same kind of thing when you're thinking about a car. Remember earlier I said around the wheel wells, they rust a lot. Uh, you know, this. I'm going to get that wet. Also around the doors, you'll see a lot of rust. And again, think about the piece you're working on, right? So if it's a, if it's a fantasy piece, 
think about where that rust is going to be. If it's cyberpunk, you know, think about that. But this just happens to be a modern day vehicle. And we all know, we've seen these cars running down the highway. It's usually like somebody's, you know, 74 El Camino that they're driving in, you know, four inches of snow and the back sliding all around everywhere. And it's got rust all around the doors and all around the wheel wells. Now, no offense to anyone who happens to drive an El Camino. I think they're kind of cool. Me personally, I drive a hearse. Um, that's that's my daily car. Now, the family also has an SUV because most of my family won't ride in the hearse. Even though that I keep telling them that eventually we all ride in one. Might as well choose when they're going to ride in it. So you guys get the effect. I'm just sprinkling the salt where I want to protect from the paint. All right, so let me set this to the side because through the magic of television, what I was going to do, now it's going to take that salt probably about 20 minutes to solidify. But I don't want to waste 20 minutes. And apologies for the noise of the compressor in the background. I don't want to waste 20 minutes waiting for this salt to dry. I'm also going to have to do this in layers. So what I've done here, I've got another body that I've already sprayed with a, kind of a blue color over the salt. So I don't know where you can see the salt over. So when we're talking about weathering on a large surface, I want to have a gradient of the paint, right? Because you think about one of these old cars that you see around, you won't see one solid color of paint next to the rust. You'll see kind of layers of, you know, oxidized colors next to something pretty close to a dulled out version of the original color. So we've got this salt on here that I've sprayed over with a coat of this dark blue. Now everybody can, can do that. We don't need to demonstrate that. But I do want to show you how to get that next layer. So over the edges of where this salt is, I'm going to go right back in with some water. Because I want to protect some of this darker blue, but not a lot of it. And again, thinking about where the sun's kind of hitting on this, it's going to lighten up that color uh, because the sun is just fading out this darker blue. But then at the sides, that darker blue is going to be a little more prominent. So I, I really just want to do this from like the top down. And all I'm doing is, is kind of the same technique we already did. Just kind of re-wetting it and putting some new salt over those colors. All right, I'm going to give it a few minutes to dry. Grab my airbrush. <coughs> that towel there. All right, so again, if you, uh, if you own an airbrush, this would be a very handy technique. Um, I happen to be using a, um, um, a Badger Patriot 105, but you don't have to have that model of airbrush. Any old airbrush will work for this, this technique. Um, and all I'm going to do is take this, you know, this darker blue. I've sprinkled some more salt on it. I want to add it a lighter blue across the top. And if I can get my paint to cooperate. I'm just using, a, this is Moonstone blue. Mixed about 50-50. With water because that moonstone blue, I don't know if it maybe it's just my bottle or whatever, it's, it's fairly thick. So I'll mix this up. All right, and I'm no airbrush expert, right? But for this, I can do it. Um, I'm just gonna and obviously should have waited for this to dry, but I'm just gonna uh, kind of lightly hit the top areas of this. And obviously, you guys do this kind of on your own. No need to sit here watching me do it. In fact, through the magic of TV, voila, we're done. Okay. Um, so we've airbrushed a lighter color over the darker color, and now we've got this salty, ugly mess. And you're thinking, well, where is the weathering? You know, what's happened here? So what you're going to do is take a thick brush, and what works good for these is say these makeup brushes for like a dollar at, at the Dollar Tree. 
Uh, absolutely, Jason. You can do the same effect with a rattle pin. And all I'm going to do is kind of scrub off this salt. And, and it's okay if you scratch it up because, hey, this is a weathered up piece of metal. And you can see the salt protected, you know, those rusted out areas. They protected the darker blue. And all we're going to do is just kind of scrub this off with a, a bigger brush. I'm using a dollar makeup brush. And the salt cleans up, you know, out of the brush with, with water and soap. Uh, but again, you don't want to use, you know, like a $40 Kalinsky sable brush to do this because it will wear out the bristles because it's such a coarse effect. But you can see as I'm scrubbing this off, there are now layers of colors under here. Um, and some areas are rusted clean through, some areas are oxidized. And the other benefit from salt over the other products that will do this. There's also a coarseness to this. There's a, now a texture to this, which you'll find in a lot of rusted out things. Now, because we uh, because we thought about where the rust is going to be the greatest, where we're rubbing off the salt, you can see that that's absolutely where the rust has stayed. And you can see here, like looking down, uh, the sun has has beaded down on the top a lot more than it has on the side. So you've got that darker, closer to original blue there. So if you imagine this came out of the factory, the bright, you know, say royal blue that was, you know, relatively shiny. Well, now it's been sent in somebody's field because, you know, um, Grandpa refused to sell his his old car, and now it's just a rusted mess. It's not worth anything. Um, sad story. There was a car very similar to this. Uh, I like old cars uh, that sat on the side of the road of the highway that I would pass every morning on my way to work. So one day, it was in pretty good shape. One day I decided to stop. And I talked to an older guy there and he told me a really interesting story about how he bought that car when he first got married and his wife was pregnant. That was their family car. Um, and now, you know, he's, he's all alone and that car kind of reminds him of his old life and he just didn't want to sell. And, you know, for me, the story alone was worth the visit with the, the older gentleman. Um, but it was heartbreaking because I watched this car over the series of years just rust away into complete nothing in his front yard. Um, and then finally, you know, as, as fate would have it, eventually the, the old man moved on to greener pastures. And, you know, by that point, the car was, was absolutely useless. Um, and was probably sold for scrap metal or something like that. But there was a period in time where that car looked a lot like this. Um, so you can see you've got varying amounts of rust, but we're still not 100% there, right? Because um, as we were talking about when we were doing the other rust effects, we want to think about how the water is pouring across things. So let's go back to our rust colors here. I want to grab some of this kind of maroon color, and I want to think, well, right here at some point, there was a door handle. And let me get my big old hand out of the way. There was a door handle here, and there was, before it fell off, it was uh, water was kind of catching on that and running down. So using our same same colors, I'm going to grab some a little bit of maroon, a little bit of the orange, and just kind of draw some some streaky lines coming from where that door handle was. Same thing here. There was a mirror here at some point, and that was also leaking down. You know, water was kind of filtering from that. So we want to kind of show that with our maroon and our our rusty orange colors. And maybe around this wheel or this fender start here, maybe there's some, some bolts that kind of hold that on. We can kind of simulate where that water is kind of catching on them. And just kind of, you know, using thinned out paint, we can uh, draw some pretty thin lines to kind of simulate where something metal up under there that's, uh, causing some additional oxidation and rust to, to flow down. What also we might think about is maybe this mirror fell off and was just hanging out by the cables. So maybe it was swinging back and forth. So we can uh, kind of get a rusty little line in there. And since it was screaming or swinging back and forth, 
um, we can take some either some silver or some white. And we can draw a very thin line to kind of simulate where that's, that's been worn down all the way to the bare metal. Now, again, when we were talking about scratches, if you got to have light, you got to have dark. So let's grab some of our, our um, midnight purple and nightshade purple and draw a very thin line on the top of that to show that eh, that's a scratch. You can imagine this mirror was just kind of swinging back and forth as it's you know, being moved around. And maybe, maybe this door has been opened up a few times. And it's actually scratched off some of the some of the rust, revealing kind of some bare metal down at the edges of that. Now, if you get a line that's too thick and just wet your brush, you can, you can almost kind of vacuum it up. We're just kind of trying to simulate that some areas are bare metal. Now again, just like we were doing earlier on the smaller pieces, we can add in some scratches. Brush a little too wet. Maybe there's a big old scratch here where something fell up against it. And this is just a nightshade purple. You can use black if you want, or you can use blue liner. But there's gonna be a, an edge to it, so we'll use the white. And we'll kind of catch that bottom edge. There you go. A nice little scratch on the side of it. And obviously, you can keep playing around with this if you decide um, that you want, you know, some part to look a little more weathered. Uh, than it did after it came out of this. Like for me, I want this to kind of be a little more rusty there. So same thing as we did before. I'll just grab my, my handy little stippling brush. And I can add in you know, rust however I want to. I'm randomly going through the, the gambit of colors that we did earlier. I just want to kind of take a, a second look at this because a lot of times uh, with this one, I, I probably blasted off some of the salt before I did the. But you guys get the idea. It's all about uh, you know getting a large area to a workable space. Most of the work has been done for you through you know the magic of the airbrush or, or the rattle can, whatever you want to use. Now, this won't work with just a, a standard paintbrush, like if you wanted to dry brush over, because you'll knock off all the salt when you try that. Um, so that's one of the reasons that, that you know you want to get a, an airbrush if you don't already have one. It doesn't have to be you know the world's best airbrush for this because all I did was you know straight spray a couple of colors. Um, so you can you can go online on Amazon and sometimes get a uh, a Tipo airbrush um, for like twenty five bucks with a little you know portable compressor and that would be just good enough to get you started. I will tell you that's what I did <laughs> for a couple of years. That served me well, but airbrush is kind of addicting. Um, so you'll be quickly upping your game with that if you <laughs> if you start small. Um, but anyway, any questions on on that effect? All right. Any questions on what we've covered in class in general? Okay. All right. So hopefully um, you guys have learned a few new tools to add to your toolbox. Obviously, we covered a lot of material in this class in a short amount of time. I hope everybody enjoyed the class. If later you got some questions, you can find me on the Discord in my audit, uh, artist channel. You can post your questions there. Um, I kind of troll around the general chat quite a bit, uh, talking smack about Rutarki. Um, you can obviously find me there and ask questions. I will keep that off the general chat, though. We don't want to spam it up too much. If you got questions, reach out to me directly. Now, after RBE, 
You can find me on Facebook. Um, just look up under my name, Dave Cecil. I'm in a, uh, a cosplay outfit wearing a top hat. So anyway, um, it's been a pleasure going through this class material with you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed the class. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I, I'd welcome your feedback. So if you enjoyed the class, jump over to my art, artist channel, let me know. And one last thing, I do have a code. If you take a more day class, I'm going to put this in chat. Um, this is the code that you can use to get a, uh, a crown emoji or emote. You just uh, type that in in the command section uh, and you can add a crown to the, the end of your name for RBE. So everybody have a great weekend. It's been a pleasure and uh, feel free to ask any questions you got after the class. And uh, thanks to our moderator, um, Taylor, it's been a pleasure. You as well. Sorry, I had some connection issue there at the end, but I will. Seems we're back for now. All right. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So, uh, with that, I think we could go ahead and close. Yeah, uh, Edward. The code is in the chat. Is in the on the. I don't know where yours is, but mine's on the right hand side in the chat. Um, oh, it's Dave, or, I would say you sent it to panelists, not everybody here. I got oh, you. I'm sorry. No worries. I will send right now. Six, nine. There we go. My fault. Oh, no, you're good. I do. I did the same thing earlier. <laughs> okay, everybody. I will see you on the, the Discord. All right. Thank you, everyone and ending the polling Thanks. now. Oh. Thanks, Dean, I appreciate it. It was a good class. Thanks, sir.